<clears throat> Hi folks, I hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. We're looking at Justin Martyr and we're looking principally, uh, most of the information that we're going to get is from a book called uh, The Living Christ and the Four Gospels by R.W. Dale. It's out, uh, well, it's, it's over a hundred and, well, it was published in 1890. So it's out of copyright now. So, um, And also we'll be looking at a more up-to-date work, uh, Historical Theology, uh, Jeffrey W. Bromley, uh, published by uh, TNT Clark. So we'll be looking at uh, Justin Martyr, um, and I hope it blesses you. So let's come before the Lord and uh, ask his blessings and... Uh, Trust that God will uh, bless you as we uh, look at Justin Martyr. Before we do, let's read the word of God and let's pray. Paul and Timothy, a servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of christ even as it is more meet for me to think of this of you all because i have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel you are partakers of my grace for God is my record, how greatly I long for you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge and in all judgment, that you may be approved, approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and prayers of God. But I would you understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds in christ are manifest in all the palace in all the other places and many of the brethren in the lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear and i think just to take encouragement there no matter what's happened to you whatever difficulties or bad things have happened to you in your life that God's turning it around and he's using you uh, to proclaim his word, okay? Okay, so let's pray. Father God, we thank you uh, for your grace. We thank you for your love. And uh, we give you the prayers and we give you the glory. We give you the honor. And uh, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your blessings, oh God. And we give you the praise today. And we pray that you would be in this video. And that it would be a blessing, Lord, in your name. And for your glory. Amen. Okay. Right, I'm going to read uh, from page 175 of R. Dale's uh, The Living Christ and the Four Gospels. Uh, chapter 10 so I'm going to read from it and then stop and then share my thoughts and read and stop and share my thoughts Justin Martyr he says was born in Neapolis the modern Neapolis which lies in the beautiful valley between Mount Gerizim sorry about this Uh, Justin Martyr was born at Neapolis, the modern uh, Nablus, which lies in the beautiful valley between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebel, near to Jacob's well and the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. His parents were heathen, and in his dialogue with Trifor, he tells with considerable grace, humour and pathos the story of his early studies. To Justin, philosophy had always been, and it always remained, the noblest of human pursuits. 
for he believed that its aim was to restore man to God. But he came to the conclusion that the disciples of the illustri illustrious men who first gave themselves to the great search after the supreme truth had unhappily forgotten the real end of the adventurous inquiry. And so it had come to pass that Platonists, Stoics and Peripatetics and the rest were more loyal to the authority of their teachers than to the truth itself. Justin's first master was a Stoic, but he says after spending considerable time with him and finding that I learnt nothing more about God, for he himself knew nothing and said that such knowledge was unnecessary, I left him and went to another who was called a Peripatetic and who in his own opinion was a very keen and clever person. In the course of a few days, the peripatetic asked Justin to name the fees he proposed to pay, and their intercourse might be profitable to both of them. Thereupon Justin left him, thinking that a man who was anxious about the money he was to get for his teaching was no true philosopher. Still, his soul was possessed with an uncontrollable desire to master the ultimate secret of the universe, and he attached himself to a Pythagorean, who had a great reputation and who had an immense opinion of his own wisdom. His new master asked him whether he had studied music, astronomy and geometry. For surely, he said, you do not hope to gaze on the truths which perfect the blessed life and you sh unless you have first learned those things which draw the soul from the things of the sense and discipline it for the world of the spirit and so enable it to behold that which is really the beautiful and the good. Justin lost heart. He knew nothing of music and astronomy and geometry. He thought that these branches of learning, if he studied them to any purpose, would occupy him for many years, and that this passion for knowledge of God would remain long and satisfied. He could not endure the delay, and yet he was sorry to go to another master, for he thought that the Pythagorean had some real knowledge of the divine mystery, which he longed to discover. But the Platonist had a great name and a teacher of Platonism settled in Neopolis. Uh, Justin therefore resolved to try Platonism. He devoted a great part of every day to his new master and soon began to glow with enthusiasm for the Platonic doctrine. Now at last his thought was moving in regions lying beyond and above the, above the vicissitudes and illusions of material things. The contemplation of those eternal ideas in which Plato found the ultimate truth and reality of all things gave his mind wings, and he trusted that soon he would have an immediate vision and knowledge of God, for this is the end of the Platonic philosophy, in quotes. I want to stop there, and I think what I find really interesting is just in Martyr's quest for truth, his quest for God, that he doesn't know where God is, he doesn't know who God is, but yet he real he feels that he's got to keep searching. And I think, you know, when I look back in my own life, um, I was always reading, even at 14, 15, 16 years of age, I was reading psychology books and philosophy and trying to find the meaning. And um, I think if you're sincerely seeking uh, you will not be subject to any superficial thinking that you want uh, deeper answers. And, you know, that's what Justin Martyr's doing. And, you know, in your own life, if you're seeking truth, if you're really genuine seeking, then you'll find it. Anyhow, we, we continue. While he was possessed with these great hopes, Oh, oh, I just want to say as well, you know, the some of these philosophers had a conceited view of themselves and were more interested in money. And I think uh, if you're a professional teacher, um, especially if you're teaching the Bible or theology, you shouldn't be really interested in money. You, you should have a passion to teach the truth, no matter what. While he was possessed with these great hopes, it was his custom to go to a lonely spot not far from the sea for purposes of meditation. On one memorable day, his solitude was disturbed and he was followed by an aged, venerable man. The gentleman has explained to Justin that he had been anxious about some of the members of his household who were away from home 
and they had come to the lonely place to see whether there was any chance of their returning. An explanation in which, under a thin and transparent veil, he indicates that Justin was a brother of his whom he hoped to bring back to the home of the father of all. Justin, of course, does not profess to recognize his meaning, but explains in return why it is that he seeks solitude. Then the two began to discuss some of the higher questions of philosophy, the difference between knowledge which is given in the ordinary sciences and the knowledge of God, whether it is possible to know God, the true nature of the soul and its immortality. The stranger then tells Justin that long before the times of those who were reverenced as philosophers that had lived, certain prophets, men, righteous, blessed and dear to God, who spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Their writings were still in existence and contained great discoveries concerning the origin and the end of all things, and concerning other matters which ought to be known to the philosopher. Then he went on to speak of Christ, the Son of God, but said, The stranger, these things are not to be seen and understood by all men, but only by those to whom it is given to understand them by God and by his Christ. Pray, therefore, that above all things the gates of light may be opened to thee. End of quote. When he had said these and many other things, he went away, and Justin never saw him again. From that time a fire was kindled in Justin's soul, a fire that was never dis extinguished. He came to have a great love for the Jewish prophets and for the friends of Christ. He found in them what he had not found in the writings of the philosophers. He left the school of Plato for the school of Christ. I just love that. I, you know, I think that if you read philosophy or if you read Western literature or Eastern literature, uh, novels and plays and whatever, then you get your Bible and you open your Bible. There is a, a, a world of difference. You can't read the prophets without your soul being stirred, without your soul being changed. Um, and so it was with Justin. We continue. This is the story which Justin tells of his own conversion in the dialogue with Trifo. Elsewhere, he says that while he was delighting in the doctrines of Plato, the courage with which the Christian met death and all other terrible things convinced him that they could not be guilty of the secret crimes with which they were charged by their enemies. It is apparent that to Justin, the Christian gospel was first of all a revel revelation of things invisible and divine. It was more than this. It brought to, to a sinful race the assurance of the infinite mercy of God, and it proclaimed the gift of eternal life. But it was in his search for wisdom that he found Christ, for in him, the gospel was also philosophy. It satisfied his unquenchable thirst for the knowledge of God. He remained a philosopher after he became a Christian and still wore the philosopher's cloak. It was the business of his life to make known the truth which God had made known to him. If through his fault other men were ignorant of the Christian revelation, the guilt of sin from which the knowledge of Christ would have saved them uh, would have saved them would be his. And so he was eager to explain his new faith to every man and was ready to discuss it with all sorts of people. There was nothing in him of the savage fierceness with which Tatian assaulted heathenism. But there was a quiet courage with no peril which no peril could subdue. We know little of his life after his conversion except that it was spent in illustrating and defending the gospel of Christ. He taught him Rome in perhaps in Ephesus and the date of his martyrdom is uncertain. It may have been the early AD 148, and it may have been late as AD 163. Of his work, some of the most important are lost. The most valuable of these is that which he had written against all the heresies. He refers to it in his first apology. Some of the books have been attributed to him can, can hardly be his. There remains his first apology, which was written, as he says, about 150 years after the birth of our Lord, and was addressed to the Emperor Marcus Antonius, his second apology, and his dialogue with Trifol the Jew, that these three were written by Justin, is universally acknowledged. I think what I find interesting there is he was a philosopher, he becomes a Christian, and he still continues to be a philosopher. 
and there's no reason why if you're a philosophy student uh, at a university and you become a Christian you know there's no reason why you can't be a philosopher <laughs> you know so don't think that just because you become a Christian you have to stop doing philosophy you can be a philosopher for Jesus we continue in his first apology he describes the weekly assemblies of the Christians quote on the day called Sunday all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long time permits then when the reader has ceased the persistent verbal verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things then we all rise together and pray and as we before said when our prayer is ended bread and wine and water are brought and the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgiving according to his ability and the people assent saying amen and there is a distribution to each and a participation that the other wit which thanks have been given and to those who are absent a portion is sent by the deacons and they who are well to to the willing give what each fit and what is collected is deposited with the president who succours the orphans and widows and those who through sickness or any other cause are in want and those who are in bonds and the strangers sojourning among us and in a word takes care of all who are in need i think that's beautiful first apology uh in nicene library uh what a beautiful you know i think it's really good to look at these little snippets of history little documents like this and you know it gives you a beautiful insight into what was going on in the early church you know the idea that christianity is anti-intellectual i mean here that reading and exhortation is encouraged um you know it's wonderful i think i just think um i like these little historical uh, bits that we can find here and there anyhow we continue dale says this was how christians met for worship in the year uh, ad 150. there is a beautiful and pathetic simplicity in the picture they were brothers and sisters in christ they sat at his table they remembered orphans and widows the sick the poor strangers who were the guests and relieved them they were in peril of suffering loss of property imprisonment and death as the penalty of their christian faith while they were sitting at the lord's table they were reminded of their peril for one of the objects for which their contributors were collected was to give relief to those who were in bonds for christ's sake so there was a lot of care practical care there for people and um you know I, I think it's in is it in acts chapter 2 where it says they had all things in common you know they they you know christianity was radical in in those days uh, we've lost that radicality we read on in several other places in the first apology justin speaks of these memoirs of the apostles which he says were read in the christian assemblies he says the angel of god who was sent to the same virgin at the time brought a good news saying behold thou shalt conceive of the holy ghost and shalt bear a son and he shall be called the son of the highest and thou shalt call his name jesus for he shall save his people from their sins as they who have recorded all the concerns our lord jesus christ have taught first apology um, cap 3 3 we continue what justin says the apostles in the memoirs composed by them which are called gospels have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them that jesus took bread and when he had given thanks said this do in my remembrance of me this is my body and that after the same manner having taken the cup and given thanks he said this is my bond and give it to them alone so what dale is doing now is 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 showing that uh, historical evidence for jesus by quoting uh, justin martyr that's what he's doing now uh, so we're beginning to see that Justin regarded the Gospels as historical and telling us historical things about Jesus. Um, in Justin's memoirs, he called one of his disciples previously known by the name Simon Peter, since he recognized him to be Christ, the Son of God, by the revelation of the Father. And since we find it recorded in the memoirs of the apostles, 
that he is the son of God. And since we call him the son, we have understood that he proceeded before all creatures from the father by his power and will, and that he became man by the virgin. Decalogue, dialogue with Trifon, cap 100. Quote, when he came out of the water, the Holy Ghost lighted on him like a dove, the apostles of the, this, uh, the apostles, as the apostles of this very Christ of ours wrought. Um, quote again, they that saw him crucified spoke in mockery the words which are recorded in the memoirs of his apostles. He said that he was the son of God, let him come down, let God save him. He writes again, he kept silence and chose to return no answer to anyone in the presence of Pilate as being declared in the memoirs of the apostles. He writes, I have already proved that he was the only begotten of the Father of all things, begotten in peculiar manner, word and power by him, and having afterwards become man through the Virgin, as we have learned from the memoirs. End of quote. Quote again, when Christ was given up the Spirit on the cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, as I learned also from the memoirs. In the memoirs which I say were drawn up by the apostles and those who followed him, it is recorded that his Sweat fell down like drops of blood. He was praying and saying, if it possible, let this cup pass. Quote, another quote. In the gospel, it is written that he said, all things are delivered unto me by my father, and no man knoweth the father but the son, nor the son but the father, and they to whom the son will reveal him. So what we're seeing here is, is Justin Martyr giving us little snippets of who Jesus is from the gospel. So what we're seeing here is a, uh, the early church um, in the second century, early in the second century, you know, we're seeing that the four gospels are authoritative and we're seeing that they regarded this as a authentic tradition and history about Jesus. He writes, Trifor is repented, rep represented as saying, I'm aware that your precepts in this so-called gospel are so wonderful and so great that I suspect no one can keep them for I have carefully read them i might quote other passage but these are sufficient for my purpose says dale the memoirs the memoirs of his apostles the memoirs drawn up by the apostles and those who followed them the memoirs composed by them the apostles which are called gospels end of quote how could justin have described more accurately the four narratives of our lord's life which are contained in the new testament Matthew and John were apostles, Mark and Luke were followers of the apostles. And it is the deserving of, of notice that in the passage in which Justin describes the memoirs as having been drawn up, not merely by the apostles, but by their followers, he is about to mention a fact which is recorded only in the Gospel of Luke. In the quotations which I have read, you have already recognized passages or references to passages which they are familiar in our Gospel. So what he's saying there is, you know the tradition of the gospels that's handed down to us that there are apostles that were involved in writing the letters uh the the um lives of jesus and there were also followers of, of the apostle that were involved so you had mark who was a follower of the disciples uh write what peter said you have luke who was a follower of paul write it down but then you have an apostle matthew and you have an apostle john so it, what Dale is saying, there's, there's an accurate, accurate representation of the tradition that was handed down. Page 184, we continue. The worth of Justin's testimony is challenged because he does not say explicitly that the memoirs which we read in the Christian assemblies in his time were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Why did he not give the names of the writers? How can we tell that these memoirs which Justin says were called Gospels with the same gospels that are in our hands today the answer to this question may be given in a single sentence when christian writers in the second and third centuries was addressing those who were not christians they did not appeal by the name to the sacred books of the church why should they matthew mark luke and john were no authorities to those who had not received the christian faith the practice of justin was the practice of other apologists Tatian, as we have seen, composed a harmony of Gospels in his address to the Greeks, though there are allusions to the passage in the first Gospel and the fourth. He never names either Matthew or John. Tertullian, when he is writing for Christians, 
uses the Gospels as freely as they are used by the modern preacher and names their writers, but in his apology their names are not once mentioned. But I repeat that our Gospels could not be described more accurately than they are described by Justin. They are memoirs, recollections, not regular and complete biographies, and they were drawn up by the apostles and those who followed them. They've already given a considerable number of passages in which Justin either quotes the memoirs or refers to the to the facts which they record. In the three works of Justin, which are universally acknowledged as genuine, Otto of Gina, who had edited Justin's works, finds more than 200 passages in which there are other quotations from our Gospels or references to them. From these quotations or references, every one of our four Gospels receives support. For example, in the dialogue with Trifo, Justin writes, Wherefore also our Christ said, when he was on the earth, of those who were affirming that Elijah must come before Christ, Elijah shall come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah has already come, and they knew him not, but have done to him whatsoever they chose. The quotation so far is almost verbally exact quotation from Matthew, but the substance of it is found in Luke. But Justin adds, and it is written, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. This is an exact quotation from Matthew and is found in Matthew only. Again, Justin says that our Lord changed the names of the two sons of Zebedee to Bonarges. This fact is recorded by Mark only. Again, he quotes the words of our Lord on the cross, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. These words are found in Luke only. Finally, he quotes our Lord saying, except you be born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. The quotation is not verbally exact, but is very, it is very difficult, I think, to resist the conviction that Justin had in his mind the two sayings of our Lord, recorded by John and recorded by John only. Except a man be born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he's saying there, basically, if you look at uh, Justin's uh, use of the Gospels, uh, he, he calls them memoirs, and um, he doesn't name them by name, but yet we know that he's talking about the four Gospels specifically because those are the texts that he's quoting from. That's what Dale is saying is an argument. It's interesting to note that Dale says that the uh, biography, uh, the Gospels, from Justin Martyr's perspective, were seen as memoirs. But it's interesting that modern scholarship is moving towards the idea that the Gospels are ancient literature in the genre of biography. Uh, that's by Richard Bowker. So that's an interesting discussion uh, and debate that we could have. Anyhow, page 186. This last passage suggests another objection to the argument resting on Justin quotations. It is alleged that in a large number of instances, the quotations from the memoirs do not exactly correspond to the text of our four Gospels, and that therefore it is probable that Justin quotes from the Gospels, which have now disappeared. It is assumed that our own Gospels, which are attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, preserve a large part of the contents of these more ancient nar narratives, but that the lost Gospels contained an earlier and therefore more trustworthy account of the Lord's life and teaching. The objection is untenable. Justin quotes 48 passages from the Pentateuch, 18 are quoted exactly, 19 with slight variations, 11 marked with divergence. He quotes 21 passages from the Psalms, 16 exactly, including 9 or 10 whole Psalms, 2 with slight variation, 3 with decided variation. He quotes 53 passages from Isaiah, 25 exactly, 12 with slight variation, 16 with decided variation. Are we to conclude that we have a later Pentateuch, a later Psalter, and a later Isaiah <laughs> than Justin had? That Justin's Pentateuch and Justin's Justin Psalter and Justin's Isaiah have been lost, have left no trace of their existence behind them, and that although our Pentateuch, Psalter, and Isaiah contain a large part of the materials which were found in the more ancient books, the materials have been rearranged by some later hand, supplanted by later traditions, modified and covered under the influence of later forms of theological thought, question mark. The inference, inference is, 
an obviously impossible one. I agree with you, Dale. The Jews are the trustworthy custodians of their sacred books. That's true. We found that with the Dead Sea Scrolls, which confirmed uh, what, um, what the Old Testament was about. page 188 in dale's book the explanation of the inexactness of a large proportion of just in quotations from the old testament is very simple and does not require any hypotheses of a lost pentateuch and a lost psalter a lost isaiah for justin to have verified all the passages that he quoted would have been a troublesome and tedious business and therefore he left many of them unverified a modern writer if he is not quite sure of the passage which he is quoting can easily turn it up when he does not remember chapter and verse his eye can run over a page after page without difficulty till he discovers the words which he is hunting for if after a few minutes search he is still at fault he has his concordance justin had no concordance and to find a passage in a clumsy unhandy unhandy ancient manuscript was a much more laborious matter than to find it in a printed book and therefore he generally trusted his memory but his memory often failed him he gave the substance of the text but missed the exact words sometimes he ran two sentences into one the figures which i have given show that this explanation is the true one of the 16 exact quotations from psalms 9 or 10 are whole psalms which he wanted to quote at whole psalm he naturally distrusted his memory and he therefore turned to the psalter and copied the exact text for shorter quotations if he was, sh if he was sure of the substance of the text it was not worthwhile to take so much trouble his quotations from the first three gospels however much less exact than even his quotations from the old testament of direct quotations professor sandy finds 67 10 are substantially exact 25 present slight variation and 32 marked variation this is in sandy the gospels in the second century page 114 and 116 there is simple and natural explanation of this great inexactness he knew the gospels very much better than he knew the old testament and he therefore verified his new testament quotations less frequently verbal verbal accuracy was not essential to his purpose the books in which the quotations occur are not commentaries two of them are defenses of the christian faith against heathenism the third is a controversial discussion with a jew if he gave the substance of the passage which he quoted from the Gospels, it was enough. Page 190. The question whether these memoirs of church apostles, these Gospels which Justin used and in his time were read every Sunday in the Christian assemblies, were the same as our Gospels, can be tried in another way. What account did the memoirs give of our Lord Jesus Christ, his history and his teaching? Listen to the following summary. Okay, so this is basically uh, summing up of Justin's arg uh, of R. W. Dale, uh, Dale's argument. It's quite a good argument, actually. I really enjoy this. R. W. Dale, the Living Christ, and the Four Gospels. It's a very, very, um, very, very, very good argument okay we're going to go a lot of scholarship here he writes uh, dale writes uh, the question whether these memoirs of church apostles these gospels which justin used and which in his time were read every sunday in the christian assemblies were the same as our gospels can be tried in another way so he he now quotes all that we know about jesus from justin martyr and gives the quotations the scriptural quotations so According to Justin, the Messiah was born without sin of a virgin. He was descended from David, Matthew 1, 9 to 6, Luke chapter, I think. Yeah, that'll do. 
uh, descended from David, Jesse, Pharaoh, Judah, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. If not, the reading here is doubtful from Adam himself. To Mary, it was announced by the angel Gabriel that while yet a virgin, the power of God or the highest should overshadow her and she should conceive and bear a son. So that's Luke 26, Luke 1. Uh, sorry, Luke 1, 26, uh, Luke 1, 35, Luke 1, 31, Matthew 1, 21, whose name she could call Jesus because he should save his people from the sins. In Matthew 1, 18, 25, Joseph observed, observing that Mary, his espoused, was with child, uh, was warned in a dream not to put her away because that which was in her womb was of the Holy Ghost. Thus, Matthew 1, 23, prophesy Isaiah uh, 7, 14, Behold, a virgin was fulfilled. The mother of John the Baptist was Elizabeth. The, the birthplace of the Messiah had been indicated by the prophecy of Micah. So we're looking at Luke 1, 57, Matthew chapter 2, verse 5 and 7, 5 and 6. There he was born, as the Romans might learn, from the census taken by Cyrenius. The first, Luke 2, 1, Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, pure creator of Judea. His life extended from Cyrenius to Pontius Pilate. So in consequence of this, the first census to Judea, Joseph went up from Nazareth where he dwelt to Bethlehem when he was a member of the tribe of Judah, Luke 2, 4. The parents of Jesus could find no lodgings in Bethlehem. So it came to pass that he was born in a cave near the village and laid in a manger luke 2 7. so this is what we're learning that justin martin knew about jesus and the gospel quotations that he's using matthew 2 1 at his birth there came a magi from arabia who knew by a star that had appeared in the heaven matthew 2 2 that a king had been born in judea matthew 2 2 2 11 having paid him their homage and offering gifts of gold and frankincense uh, Matthew 2, 1, 7, to return to Herod, whom they had consulted on the way, he, however, not willing that the child um, should escape, ordered a massacre of all of all the children in Bethlehem, fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah. So that's Matthew 2, 16, Matthew 2, 17, 18, Matthew 2, 13, 15. Joseph and his wife, meanwhile, with the babe, fled to Egypt. For the father resolved that he too had given birth should not die. And there uh, is literally. Uh, I'm, I'm going to continue this. I know it's a bit heavy for people, but this is more of a scholarly uh, video tonight. So I'm going to keep going because it's very important evidence. This actually what he's actually giving. Uh, before he preached his word as a man, they, though they stayed until Archelaus succeeded Herod and then returned, Matthew 2.22. By process of nature, he grew to the age of 30 years or more. Not commonly aspect has been prophesied, practiced the trade of the carpenter, Luke 3.23, Matthew 4, Matthew 6.3. Uh, he remained hidden until John the herald of his coming came forward matthew uh, 17 12 13 the spirit of elias being in him uh, matthew 3 2 that he sat by the rivers of jordan and cried luke 3 3 to men to repent and he preached matthew 3 4 in his wild garb and he declared that he was not the christ but the one stronger than he was coming after john 1 19 uh, matthew 3 11 and 12 luke 3 16 17. the later history of john uh, justin also mentions how having been put in prison at a feast of herod's birthday he was beheaded as as at the instance of his sister's daughter this john was elias who was to come before the christ at the baptism of john a fire was kindled on the jordan and as he went up out of the water the holy ghost delighted upon him and a voice was heard from heaven saying the words of David, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And that's in uh, Matthew uh, 17, 11, 13, uh, Matthew 3, 16, and Luke 3, 21, 22. 
After his baptism, he was tempted by the devil who ended by claiming homage for him. Matthew 4, 1 to 9. To this, Christ replied, get thee behind me. Uh, Matthew 4, 11 and Luke 4, 13. So the devil departed from him at the same time, worsened and convicted. Justin knew that the words of Jesus were short and concise, not like those of a sophist, that he wrote miracles might be learned from the acts of Pontius Pilate. And then in Matthew 9, 29, 31, uh, he quotes Matthew 4, 23, Matthew 9, 18. We could go on and on and on, but basically what we're seeing here is basically um, a scholarly showing of the use of the Gospels by Justin Martin. What we're seeing is very, very clear with absolute solid evidence. Um, very, very clear picture of the life of Jesus. And it is the same story that is presented in the four Gospels. So it's not possible to take uh, the argument that Dr. Price and other people take and say that he didn't, uh, that the, you know, that the Gospels are late Gospels and um, kind of legendary embellished. Uh, the solid evidence that we see here from Justin Martyr is that there was a clear storyline of who Jesus was, very, very clear. It was not something that developed. It was a very, very clear who Jesus was. Okay. It was not part of Justin's intention to give a regular narrative of the Lord's life, says Dale. References and allusions to it occur incidentally in the course of his own apologies and in his dialogue with Jude Trifo. And yet when these references and allusions are drawn together, they constitute an account of the Lord's birth and the principal events connected with it of his baptism by John and of John's preaching, imprisonment, death of our Lord's temptation and his miracles his election of the apostles, his great discourse, his intuition of the supper, his agony in Gethsemane and in his crucifixion and resurrection, such as any of ourselves might write with the first three gospels in our memory. The story which Justin knew is the story which we know. You have noticed that he has a few statements concerning our Lord, which are not contained in any of our gospels. Of these, the accounts of the fire which was kindled on the Jordan at our Lord's baptism and the word said to have been heard from the heaven at the baptism thou art my son this day have I begotten thee instead of thou art my beloved son in thee I am well pleased occur in some very ancient versions of Matthew and Luke and represent early readings in those two gospels that our Lord worked as a carpenter and made plows and yokes may have been a tradition so may the statement that the wise men who according to Matthew came from the east, came from Arabia. The statement that Herod ordered a massacre of all the children in Bethlehem was probably nothing more than a slip of memory. Whatever way these variations from the story contained in our own Gospels may be accounted for, it remains certain that the story contained in Justin Gospel was the same as that which it contained in ours. In Professor Sandy's summary of Justin's reference and allusions to our Lord's history, there is no mention of any fact or of any teaching that appears in John Gospel only. But I have already given one passage from the Apology, which in my judgment must have been drawn from John's account of the Lord's conversation with Nicodemus. There are other passages in the first Apology and second, and also in dialogue with Trifle, which seem to have been suggested by John's Gospel. And one very striking passage, which must have been suggested by John's first epistle, as the epistle seems seems to have been a letter written to accompany the gospel. A quotation from the epistle is equal in value to a quotation from the gospel. Further, just 
just in doctrine concerning the eternal word is the doctrine which is expounded in the prologue to John's gospel. In Justin's own writings, therefore, there is a decisive evidence that the Gospels which he himself used and which were read in the Christian assemblies about the middle of the second century were the Gospels of our New Testament. But this conclusion is supported by evidence from, from other sources. Tatian was Justin's comrade and friend, and Tatian in the Diatoton, we have seen, was a welding together of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. It is credible that Tatian, who shared with Justin the perils of martyrdom, Drop the Gospels which were written, as Justin says, by the Apostles and, and followers of the Apostles and used for the Diasatraton, another set of Gospels of which Justin knew nothing. Further, it was in AD 150 that those Gospels of which Justin speaks and from which he quotes so large a number of passages were read every Sunday when the Christians met for worship. About 35 years later, Irenaeus constructed an elaborate argument to prove that there must be four Gospels and only four. By universal concession, the Gospels which Irenaeus used were the same as our own. If they were not the same as Justin's, um, what had become of the earlier narratives? Narratives written by the Apostles and followers of the Apostles. How did it happen that these ancient and more authentic narratives disappeared? How did it happen that they were replaced by documents of later origin and of inferior authority? How did it happen that no tradition or trace of the abandonment of the earlier Gospels and the acceptance of the later, no protest against the change can be found in the writings of the men who were living when the change was effected? Some tough questions there and against the sceptic and they're really quite formidable in debunking um, the sceptic there. The difficulty of answering these questions is enormously increased by the fact that the old Gospels, Justin Gospels, were not mere private documents, a few copies of which were in the possession of Christian scholars, but public documents read every Sunday in the church assemblies. They were written, so Justin believed, and so his contemporaries believed by the gospel apostles and their followers. How did it happen that the churches consented to the withdrawal of these authoritative and sacred narratives of the Lord's life? I think uh, I think Justin there. Uh, I think Dale mm -hmm. does a good job there um, in giving a really good synopsis of what Justin Martyr thought about the Gospels and thought about Jesus. And if you compare what Justin is saying about Jesus and his use of the Gospels, what it completely blows out of the water any modern scholarship that would say that the Gospels are a late date. Because what we're seeing is a very, a very clear tradition that believes certain things about the Gospels and had a clear understanding of who Jesus was. This is not uh, an ongoing myth developing which was arbitrary and which um, was just being put together by various communities. This is a very true, clear story that was being passed on in an authoritative way by a certain text, which are the Gospels. Okay, so that, that's uh, really a bit of the life of Justin Martyr and uh, scholarship on the Gospels and the life of Jesus from Justin Martyr. We could have gone a lot more in historical theology, uh, there's a lot of stuff um, in here, um, a heck of a lot of stuff. Uh, I'll read what Justin Martyr says about reason uh, from Jeffrey Br Bromley. We can't read everything about Justin Martyr, but uh, Justin Martyr um spoke about god spoke about the kingdom of god spoke about christ general resurrection the work of christ christ as reason christian worship etc so we'll see what he had to say about reason bromley says justin appeals to the pagan world for reason in its dealings with christians the use of reason will take the double form of one honoring the truth 
and two speaking and doing what is right by implication justin espouses here the truth and rationality of christian teaching and practice oh we could read so much more about justin martin what a great guy love the guy great servant of god used his philosophy training uh, to defend the faith and if you're a philosophy student today and you come to know jesus use your gifts to defend the faith all right thank you for listening and i uh, hope that's uh, a blessing to you i think uh, Just play some uh, Greek Orthodox music. Or Taze. in prayer with this one i'm going to do a lecture now uh, on uh, missiology uh, my own work and i hope this has been an encouragement to you stu to study justin martyr to look into him and to research him and i uh, hope it's a blessing we're going to go through uh, a lot more in detail and uh, so yeah and it's going to get more and more scholarly as we go on uh, so hope you enjoyed this let's close in prayer father god we thank you uh, for your mercies and blessings and we thank you for the great justin martyr for his stand for truth and his passion for you lord i thank you that you raised him up and used him mightily for your glory and father i pray that you would raise up many justin martyrs many men and women who are philosophers who are passionate for philosophy but they bow the knee to you lord jesus christ and they use their gifts for your glory and uh, so lord i pray that you bless them and i pray that they would trust in you i pray for all of us lord that we, that we would look to you in jesus name amen